This story is part of a series. There are five previous parts, so if you haven't watched those yet, check the pinned comment and you can navigate this series a bit more easily. With that out of the way, let's jump into this. Working at an amusement park. The Nurse. Written by Girl from the Crypt. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. I work at an amusement park where only half of the actors are actual actors. After I'd introduced the two pretenders from the Hollywood section in my last post, I'll have to touch on one of my earlier mentions again this time. I never really thought I would have to talk a lot about the nurse. The only questions asked about her have been inquiries as to whether or not she's hot because apparently my description of her missing her lower jaw and being brain dead have not been a sufficient answer to that. However, there have also been comments about how her non-threatening and rather pitiable appearance may be a front and that she might be more dangerous than she's letting on. I admit I never really truly took that possibility into consideration, but if I ever had reason to believe that it could be the case, today is the day that I got it. I came into work around 12 and went straight for the cage of the sock puppet. He was apparently expecting me since he was sitting outside his shelter and instantly came bounding towards me. It's rare that I receive such an exuberant greeting from him, but I guess he does have his lively days after all. By the way, some of you asked if I have ever played fetch with him, and I did try to do so a couple of times before opening hours, but I was never too successful. Whenever I would throw a ball for him, he would just look at me stupidly instead of running after it. One time I brought in a plushie to see if that would get him going, and it actually did. He chased after it, but instead of bringing it to me, he attempted to eat it. At least until he noticed that what he was digging his teeth into was merely a helpless heap of cotton and not some kind of treat. He went on to stare at me with a look of betrayal for that entire day. I think the concept of playing is simply beyond his understanding. Anyways, after feeding and grooming him a little, we set out on our daily walk around the park. On our way, we encountered Mitchell. He was sitting at a table outside a saloon in Twinvale Point, eating his homemade lunch. I sat down across from him, and we talked for a while. At first, only about this and that, until, for some reason, the topic of Darius came up. Have you seen him at all lately? I remember Mitchell asking. I shook my head. Not really, no. But I don't blame him. I mean, it's not like the nurse needs him around or anything. Mitchell shrugged. I don't think the cowboy needs me either, but I still come to check up on him. As proven by you sitting here eating, I remarked, raising a brow. Mitchell gulped down a bite of his sandwich. It's not like that. He's fine. I just went to see him. He's with Nathan, riding around on that carriage again. If you say so. Mitchell sighed. <sighs> All I'm saying is that it feels weird not having seen Darius around for so long. I wonder if he's okay. Have you tried calling him already? I suggested, and Mitchell shook his head no. Let's try it then, I added, taking out my cell phone and dialing his number. We waited for Darius to answer for about half a minute before I gave in and ended the call. Strange, I muttered. You'd think he'd have time to answer his phone, Mitchell remarked. I got a bad feeling about this. You think something's happened to him? I frowned. I hope not. Let's just try again later, or maybe he'll call back. Mitchell finished up his lunch and then got to join me in walking with the sock puppet. It was sort of nice having someone to talk to tag along. Even though he made a point to keep his distance from Mr. Scratch, he's a bit wary of him. We went all the way over to the break room of the horror section, Mr. Scratch nudged me gently as if wanting to say goodbye before trotting away to his cage. Leaning against the wall of the small building the break room is in, I took out my cell phone again. I figured that this time, Darius would take my call. Mitchell looked at me expectantly. We waited in vain. Until, suddenly, I thought I could hear a ringtone coming from inside the small building. I gestured for Mitchell to follow me as I proceeded to open the door and enter the break room. The sound of the ringtone got louder. It did not take long for us to find the source. Darius' cell phone was lying abandoned on top of the table, right next to his backpack. I ended the call and picked up my coworker's smartphone. It showed seven missed calls in total, two of which I knew were my own. Most of the others were listed as mom and dad. There was even a message from his mother reading, I thought you were going to come over this morning. Mitchell and I exchanged concerned glances. He was the first out of the two of us to speak up. That means he's got to be around here somewhere, right? I nodded sternly. We have to look for him. 
I uttered, a dry feeling in my throat. We decided it would be best to split up. While I began looking by the candy section, Mitchell stayed in the ghost town. We promised that we would call each other over the phone as soon as we find any trace of our missing friend. It was eerie walking through Candyland all by myself. I remember wishing I had the sock puppet by my side. Even though I had my whip with me, I couldn't help but feel vulnerable on my own. The thought of Darius lying around somewhere, possibly severely wounded or even worse, made my stomach churn. I passed the little stage where the sugar plum fairy was rapidly dancing as always. I spotted the mime perched on top of the light fixture over her head, like a spider resting in its web. I felt a shiver run down my spine as I was instantly reminded of that one morning that I had chased him through the park. Thankfully, neither of them appeared to notice me walking by, or maybe they were simply minding their own business. Who knows what these two. I didn't dare break the silence hanging over me by calling Darius's name. The 20 minutes that I spent combing through every corner of the candy section may have just been some of the tensest of my entire life. By the time I worked my way back to Twinville Point, I felt like I was ready to explode. Therefore, I don't blame myself for jumping at the sudden sound of hooves hitting the sandy street. I spun around to find that the stagecoach had rolled up behind me. Nathan, who was sitting atop the coach seat as always, was staring over at me with a calculative look on his face. I held his gaze for what seemed like an eternity before he finally raised his hand and waved me over. Either I was creeped out by Nathan's silent attitude or my already anxious mind was running wild with me, but I caught myself inconspicuously checking the roof of the carriage in hopes of spotting the laughing cowboy. Ever since I started thinking about how much he had actually been helping me in the past, I've begun to feel a lot safer around him, but he was nowhere to be found. It was just Nathan and me with no one else in sight. I swallowed my unease and approached the coachman. As I got closer, I couldn't help but wrinkle my nose at the stench that old blanket wrapped around his shoulders was emanating. It smelt like horse, but somehow even stronger than an actual horse, if that makes sense. Hi, I stammered. Have you... I was interrupted by Nathan leaning over to me. If it's your friend that you're looking for, I saw him enter one of the fun houses last night. The one that looks like an abandoned hospital. He told me in a low, husky voice. With that, he straightened up in his seat again, and on his command, the horses began trotting off. I didn't even have time to thank him. Heeding his advice, I began running all the way back to the horror section, fumbling for my cell phone in the process. I called Mitchell, who was thankfully not too far away, and told him to meet me in front of the fun house Nathan had told me to go to. We arrived there at the same time, both of us panting heavily. As soon as we caught our breath, we headed inside. The haunted hospital concept is a bit overused in my opinion, but it's still good for a scare if pulled off correctly. While I don't know who designed this fun house in the theme park I work at, they did a really good job. The entrance to the hospital looks like an actual sliding glass door had been broken down. The building itself is not that big, as there are only four main rooms. The first room looks like a reception area. There's even a large desk with an old broken computer on it, and a puppet that looks like a rotten corpse is sitting on a swivel chair right behind it. The second one is just a long, empty hallway with an old wheelchair standing around in it. Usually the nurse will be sitting in there, or just standing in the middle of the room, forcing the visitors to squeeze past her. The third room is where Darius would normally be. It holds a hospital stretcher with another corpse prop on it, and there are several fake severed limbs hanging from meat hooks on the ceiling. This may sound lame the way I describe it, but it looks pretty freaky with flashing lights. The last room is basically just the exit, but it holds some skeleton animatronics that can pop out of the walls to either side. Since none of the attractions, including the funhouse, are being powered, Mitchell and I had no special effects to scare us. That, however, didn't help the fact that we were both on the brink of wetting our pants. Darius? I called out, my voice trembling ever so slightly. Both Mitchell and I jumped when we heard a low groan come from somewhere close by. We ran forward in the long hallway to find our co-worker slouching in the ragged wheelchair. Upon seeing us barge in, he arduously lifted his head. Oh my god, I whispered before rushing to his side. What happened? Mitchell joined me and together we heaved Darius up from the wheelchair. It took us some time to carry him out of the funhouse and into the break room where we sat him down on one of the benches. By then he had fully regained consciousness and was sobbing quietly while thanking us profusely at the same time. We need to get you to a hospital, I told him, fumbling for my car keys. 
Yes, I noticed the irony in that. I added, feeling Mitchell's eyes upon me. Wait, no. Darius coughed and leaned forward, holding out his hand to stop me. I'll be fine. It was mostly shock. Really. Are you sure, man? Mitchell asked, looking down at him worriedly. Yeah. It's alright, he muttered weakly. Fine. I sat down on the break room table facing Darius. What happened back there? Darius straightened up and cleared his throat. I came in yesterday night to check up on the nurse. I figured she might... I don't know. She never needs anything, but I just wanted to make sure everything was alright over here. I couldn't find her immediately, so I went into the funhouse since she hangs out in there most of the time. I found her standing in the hallway facing the wall, right next to the wheelchair. I think I wanted to take her outside. I don't know why anymore. Maybe just for some fresh air? Can't hurt, right? So I go up to her, and I place my hands on her shoulders as always, and then all of a sudden she spins around, and she grabs me and pushes me into the wheelchair, and then... His voice trailed off as his face consorted in disgust. And then she just takes her hand and shoves it down my throat. She was holding something, I think. Something small and cold. I don't even know what it was. But she pulls her hand back out, so I swallow it. He retched slightly at the memory. Everything went dark after that. I guess I passed out due to the shock. That's happened to me before. He let out a long sigh. I can't believe it. I've been assigned to the nurse for five years. She's never shown any signs of, well, sentience before. And now all of a sudden, this outburst? I don't get it. What in the world is going on with her? And other than that, you're okay? I asked softly. Does it hurt anywhere? Darius shook his head. No, it was just a shock. I'm sure of it. How long was I out for? Well, right now it's 2.40 p.m., Mitchell stated, glancing at his watch. Yeah, we found your phone and all. I think your parents are really worried. Better call them. Tell them you had an accident, I suggested, handing Darius his backpack. But still, you should go see a doctor. Who knows what that thing was that she had you swallow. Darius nodded slowly. Yeah, okay, fine. Come on, Mitchell grunted, pulling him to his feet. I'll drive you. Thanks. Uh, one more thing, though. Where's the nurse at right now? Mitchell and I exchanged worried glances. Neither of us had encountered her while looking for Darius. Finally, I bit my lip and said, You two go see a doctor. I'll stay and look for the nurse. I ushered them out the door and watched as Mitchell guided Darius, who was still a bit wobbly on his feet, to the employee entrance after I had set out on my search. I didn't really know where to look or what I'd do if I find her, but I decided to take Mr. Scratch with me this time. I did not want to wander the park on my own again. I went to the Hollywood section first. There I met Caroline, who was thankfully coming in like clockwork as always. I waited for her to ask the pianist her question, and afterwards I told her about what had happened to Darius. She was understandably unsettled and joined me in looking for the pretender. I think Mr. Scratch spotted her first, seeing as his low growl alerted the two of us before we even laid eyes on her. She was sitting on a bench in front of an ice cream parlor, unmoving and voidly staring down at her feet. Caroline and I contemplated on what to do. Finally, I came to the conclusion that we would lock her up in the sock puppet's cage and have him sleep in the break room instead. The nurse put up no resistance. I approached her from behind and placed my hands under her arms to lift her up. Then Caroline and I each grabbed one of her arms so we would have more control over her in case she would suddenly go rampant again. And we proceeded to walk her all the way back to the horror section. She was still staring past us absently as we locked her in. We then took a seat on a bench nearby from where we had a good view on the cage. We spent about half an hour talking and petting the sock puppet before I got a call from Mitchell. I was surprised at the happiness and apparent relief in his voice as he greeted me. I told him Caroline and I had caught the nurse and then inquired about Darius' estate. Mitchell chuckled awkwardly. Yeah, about that. The doctor says he's fine. His throat seems to be okay too. We didn't tell him the truth about what happened, obviously, but we didn't have to make him an excuse either. You see, while we were waiting for him to be examined, Darius had to go to the toilet real quick. Turns out the thing the nurse shoved down his throat was a key. A key, I repeated incredulously. Yeah, after a couple hours it just came back out the natural way, I guess. That is wild, I muttered. 
We need to find out how she got her hands on it. I mean, what's she even doing with a key? And what it unlocks, Carolyn added from besides me. How about we all meet up here tomorrow and figure this out together? There are a couple things I've been wanting to try, and I need help with them anyways, I suggested. Carolyn nodded eagerly, and Mitchell agreed. I reminded them to tell Darius, and to bring the mystery key. Carolyn immediately called Oliver, and I informed Anne and Maxine. We'll all meet up at the large saloon in Twinville Point tomorrow, at 4 in the afternoon. I don't know what we'll be able to find out, if we'll be able to find out anything at all, but I do believe this will be interesting. Plus, this is my chance to try and get some other answers out of the other not-actors. I know the cowboy can't talk, but as a lot of commentators have pointed out, he might be able to write or tell us something in a visual way. As for the aged diva, I believe that maybe her handler Oliver can try and get through to her. The two seem to have somewhat of a connection, so it's at least worth a try. I don't think the pianist will be too helpful, but Carolyn says asking some more questions for once probably won't hurt. I must admit, I'm excited. We just might be getting some answers after all. Some very interesting goings on. I, I still probably wouldn't be too scared of the nurse. All she did was shove a key down a guy's throat, which ain't nice, but it's not exactly as bad as giving somebody a heart attack, like the pianist, or eating them, like Mr. Scratch. <laughs> so I think all in all, she's, she's still relatively harmless, but I'm looking forward to find out what that key unlocks. Yes, indeed. So join us tomorrow, and we'll find out together, friends. Don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe if you did enjoy the video. Check out some of the other videos on my channel while you wait. And I will be back again tomorrow with another No Sleep Creepy Pasta. Thanks as always for watching. Keep yourself safe out there. And until then, friends. Bye-bye.